Up to now, we've used though I urge you to read the section on interactive programming in the text, and then to work the exercises in the course notes. Up to now, we've used standalone scripts to demonstrate the shell programming constructs that we've covered. A standalone script is one that performs a single task, and that's it. PHAD is used to add names to the phone list. That's all it does. PHFIND only searches for names in the phone list. That's all it does. If a user, besides the person who wrote these scripts, wanted to use them to work with the phone list, they'd have to know the name of the PHAD script, the directory the PHAD script was in, the name of PHFIND, the directory it was in, as well as the absolute path name of the phone list file itself, in case they needed to list out the file or do anything directly to the data in the file. This is okay if you're using the scripts that you wrote because you're going to know all this information. However, shell scripts are often used to create larger applications that other people will be executing. People who don't necessarily know anything about the Unix system but who need to use the computer. In my experience, most complete applications use several scripts that work with one another. As a result, we have to come up with a way to communicate information amongst various scripts that work together as a single application. And that's part of what we're going to be covering in this section. Let me give you the example. If somebody wanted to work with the phone list, but didn't know anything about Unix, we should provide them with an interface that allows them to do what they need to do without having to operate at the shell. Instead, I'm going to suggest that we provide them with a menu of options where they merely have to pick a character to identify what it is they wish to do. The menu options are add new names to the phone list, list out a pattern in the phone list, print the entire phone list, or sort the phone list. This could be written as a single script. It's not that big an application. However, we've already written phadd, and we've already written phfind. It'd be best if we use those in conjunction with another script as we begin building this application. One benefit is that as you decide to add more capabilities to this application, you can do that by writing separate scripts and hooking them in instead of expanding one script that will eventually get too large and be difficult to maintain. Now because we're going to be using several scripts that work together, we have to make sure that they all communicate and work properly. In the current version of phadd and phfind, we've hard-coded the name of the file that is used as the phone list. It makes sense to me that people will not always use the same phone list file. I'm a good example of this. It turns out that I maintain two separate phone files. One for my personal acquaintances and one for my business acquaintances. The format of these files is exactly the same. All the scripts I write to maintain one phone list will work to maintain the other phone list. As a result, I can maintain both phone lists using the same code. The only difference between two separate programs would be the absolute path name of the phone list file I'm using. 
As a result, I don't want to hard code the name of the phone list in either phadd or phfind. Instead, I'd rather be able to establish which one I want to use and have phadd and phfind use that one. I also want to be able to change it later in case I need to access information in one of the other phone files. I could implement this by passing the name of the phone list file as an argument on the command line. Unfortunately, even though this works, it can get to be cumbersome. What's more, there's a better solution. Turns out, you can use the environment of the process that is executing the scripts. That's what we're going to cover now. While this is an oversimplification, a process has six parts. Three of those parts are the standard input, output, and error devices. The fourth part is the program code being executed by this process. The other two parts describe the global environment of this process which is to say, the environment within which the program is executing, and also a local environment, which is the memory used by this program as it executes. Let's look at how Unix creates and executes programs to understand how an environment's process gets created and how we can use it to coordinate between different programs. Executing a program on the Unix system takes two steps. First, because everything on the Unix system is done within a process, you have to create a process before you can execute a command. The first step, then, is for Unix to create a process. On the Unix system, a process is created by making a copy of an existing process. This is called forking a process. And in fact, it makes an exact duplicate of the process that is executing this command. The only distinction between these two duplicate copies of the same process is that the one that has been copied identifies itself as the copy. The original is unchanged. Now that we have a new process, we can perform the second step, which is called execing a program. We have a process. To make it run a new program, we simply have to overwrite the program part of this process. The other information remains the same the standard input, output, and error devices in the global environment. Note that when this new program is executing, it will be executing in the same environment of the process that created it. Because when the copy of this new process was made, it includes a copy of the global environment. When the program begins executing, it needs its own memory and therefore exec overwrites the local environment, which makes sense, since the new program has no need for the old program's memory. Once the fork has occurred, and once the exec has occurred, you have a new process running a different command, and in fact, your command is now executing. Let's review briefly. In order to execute a command, you have to do two things on the Unix system. First, you have to create a process. Second, you have to make that new process run the command that you want. Every command you execute inherits your current environment. Because a new process inherits the current environment, if I can move information into the environment of my current process before I execute a command, then I can pass information from my current process 
to a new process through this environment transfer. This is a second way to communicate with another program. One would be through its list of arguments. The second would be through the inheritance of the global environment. In fact, many programs you run do exactly this. Since every program you're running inherits the shell's environment, there's a good deal of information that's part of your shell environment that is destined for other programs that may be executed. One example is VI. Because VI is written to work on virtually any terminal, it has to know which terminal you're running on to work properly. In this case, I'm using a 10-year-old Televideo 925. For VI to work properly on this terminal, it has to know how to control the terminal. VI has a large database of terminal types and the control characters for each terminal. When VI runs, it looks in the environment of the process that is executing VI to see if you've assigned the type of terminal in the environment. If so, it takes that information out of the process's environment, looks up in the database to get the information on how to control the terminal, and then begins executing. If you don't provide this information, VI will not go into interactive mode, but instead will sit there in line mode because it doesn't know how to control the terminal. Another example is your home directory. The shell knows your home directory because it's part of the environment. If you change the definition of your home directory, when you type CD, you'll be moved somewhere else. The environment is maintained through variable values in the same way that you assign values inside a shell script. The difference is that variables in the environment have been marked as part of the environment. In Unix, we call these variables exported variables because the value of these variables will be exported to every process created from here down. It's called exported because that's the command you use to move a variable from your local environment into your global environment. You export that variable's value. For example, the variable that VI uses that everybody agrees on is called term, T-E-R-M. In order to make the value of term available to VI, which will be executed in a separate process, I have to export term into my environment. First, I have to set term to be the appropriate value, and then I run the command export space term, which tells the shell to mark the term variable as one that is to be exported when this process gets forked. Note that the variable term is capitalized. This is not required. However, it is a convention that is used by virtually all the shell programmers I'm familiar with. The idea is to make it clear which variables are part of the global environment and which ones are part of the local environment. The convention says that exported variables are always capitalized and non-exported variables always contain at least one or more lowercase characters. We'll use this same convention. If you want to see which variables are currently exported in your process, you can run the command env, which will list out the variables in your current environment. Note that all the variables listed have capital characters in the name. 
If you want to look at the local environment, you can type the set command, S-E-T, and it will show you the variables set in your local environment. Let's take a look at some of the environmental variables that are very important and need to be defined and exported into the environment so that your system works properly. Notice the environment variable called path, P-A-T-H. The path variable holds a set of directories that get searched when you execute a command. The commands you execute do not sit in your current directory. They're scattered throughout the system in various other places. How does the shell know where the command you want to execute sits? It doesn't. Instead, it looks in the environment for a variable called path and then searches the directories listed in that variable. If you forget to put the appropriate directory in your path variable, you won't find the commands that are in that directory. And you'll keep getting messages, command not found. Path is a colon separated list of directories. Its format is described in the course text in more detail, should you need it. We've talked about the variable term, which identifies the terminal type that you're using. Home is actually set by the system and is the absolute path name of your home directory. Shell identifies the absolute path name of your current shell, which is used by programs like VI or Mail when you request that a shell be executed so you can execute commands while you're running mail or VI. Editor is another example which identifies the editor you want to use. There are other exported variables that are important and I've listed those in the course text. Incidentally, they're also listed in the manual pages of the shell that you're using. And it's always a good idea to reference that. There are two other variables that I want to mention that are part of the environment. In the born shell, your current prompt is stored in the variable PS1. The secondary prompt is stored in the variable PS2. PS1 holds a dollar sign and a space because that's the prompt the shell prints every time it needs you to enter a command line. The secondary prompt is a greater than in a space, which is printed when the shell has to display the secondary prompt. If you change what's stored in PS1, the shell's prompt changes as well. As a simple example, I'm going to define my prompt to be Ray followed by a dollar sign followed by a space. Note that as soon as I press return, my prompt becomes what I've assigned to PS1. Exporting is not required because you're in the shell that is using that prompt. If you wanted to use this prompt in a shell that was to be started later, you'd have to export PS1. Which brings me to some rules about exporting that you should be aware of. When you export a variable, the current setting of that variable is exported into the environment. If you later change what's stored in that variable, it has no effect on the current environment of that process unless you re-export the variable. Be careful. Sometimes you will update a global variable, but forget to export it which means that the change hasn't migrated from the local environment into the global environment and the old setting will still be used. Where do these environment variables get set when you log in? You don't set them yourself, so where do they come from? The shell has a special startup file whose primary job is defining the variables that will be part of your environment. In the born shell, 
This is called dot profile and it's stored in your home directory. Let's take a look at a simple one that I'm using for this video course. In this dot profile, I'm assigning path of value, term of value, shell of value, and editor of value, and then exporting those variables. In order to set up its environment properly, when you log in, the born shell first executes the contents of dot profile. You don't see a prompt on your screen until dot profile has been executed. In the course text, I've described in detail those variables that are used by the born shell, some of which we've covered, some of which we haven't. And I'll refer you to the textbook on that. In addition to using the environment of the current shell as I execute commands interactively, I also can use exported variables within applications that I've written. Going back to where we started this section, I have a need to tell all of the scripts in my phone list application the name of the file that holds the phone list. What I'm going to do is establish a phone list exported variable that I will then use in all the scripts that are going to be part of the phone list application. A variable that's part of the environment will be used by all of these scripts when it comes time to read or write to the phone list. In my case, I'm going to use the variable phone file. Because it's going to be exported, it's in all caps. This is what the new ph find script then would look like. The very first thing is to test if phone file has a value. We do this with the dash Z option of the test command. If phone file has no value, that means one was never exported into the environment. And as a result, phone file has no value. In those cases, I'm going to use a default phone list, which is stored in slash USR slash data slash phone dot list. And you see that I assign that to phone file here. In either case, when I get to the end of the if statement here, phone file is assigned an absolute path name, either directly from the environment or from the assignment statement here. I then go and take the first argument off the command line and search for that in the file identified by the phone file variable. All of the scripts that are called from the phone list application will have to check to make sure that phone file is assigned a value, and if not, to use a default. Otherwise, if phone file remains unassigned, the scripts will fail. That means that in the script that begins the phone list application, phone file will have to be assigned there and export it into the environment at that point. In order to be a little bit more flexible, I'm actually going to have the testing code in the main routine as well. Because some users may want to define phone file in their dot profile file so that they use their own phone list instead of one that gets set automatically when they run the phone list application. Let me show you how the main line for the phone list application works. Because it's going to be a menu, we have to print a menu, read in the user's selection, and then decide what to do based on that selection. Printing a menu is very easy. You simply have a set of echo statements. And you see the statements that will print our menu here. 
Once the menu's been printed, we read in the choice the user has made. I'm going to use the variable choice here. Next, we go into a case statement, where we simply check and see which option the user has entered. By the way, note that I've added an option to quit the menu because users have to have a way to stop what they're doing. If the user's selection is A, then we're going to run the script phone.add, which is the export-based version of phAd. If the user selects L, we're going to prompt for the pattern to list, and then send that pattern to phone.find, which is the export-based version of phFind. If the user selects P, we're simply going to cat out the phone list file. If they select S, we're going to sort the phone list file, and using the dash O option of sort, put that sorted version back in the same file. If the user selects Q, we're going to assign our loop test variable to be in, which will break us out of the while loop that controls the repetition of the menu. Let me show you how this script begins. First, we test if phone file has been defined. If so, we leave it alone. If not, we assign it a value, and then we export the assigned value. Because if I change the value of an exported variable, I have to re-export it to make sure it gets into the environment. I then set my loop test variable equal to y, because that's my first test to see if I can loop within the script. Once I'm inside the script, I print the prompts, read the selection, make the choice, and then move on from there. I've listed the entire script in the course notes, as well as versions of phone add and phone find. When you put them all together, let me show you how they work. I've put it on my system here as PH menu. When I run PH menu, it prints the ALPSQ prompt, and ask me to enter the letter of my choice. If I'd like to list information in the phone list, I enter L, it asks me what to search for. Let me search for Swartz. You see that I'm in the list. Let's suppose I want to print out the entire list, so I enter option P, you see that. Entering Q quits the menu and brings me back to the shell prompt. The purpose of showing you PH menu was twofold. One was to demonstrate how to use the environment of a process to send information to another process. Second was to show you how you can combine scripts together into a larger application. Now I need to tell you about two other features. One of them involves what happens when the user presses the interrupt key on their keyboard? Because the Unix system is a multi-processing environment, there are lots of things going on. When the user presses the interrupt key, the system has to make sure that the appropriate process gets sent this interrupt message. Unix does this by sending signals to processes. When a process receives a signal, it terminates, unless you tell it to do something different. There's lots of reasons why a signal is sent to a process. One of them is if the user hits control C or the delete key or however you've assigned interrupt to your terminal. Another one is through the use of a command called kill, which sends a kill signal to a process. There's lots of operating system reasons for processes to be sent signals. However, the most important one for script writers is the interrupt key because that's something that users can generate from their keyboard. If you want your scripts not to terminate just because somebody has interrupted them, then you have to be able to handle the interrupt signal. To provide you with the ability to handle signals, 
The Bourne shell provides the trap command. The trap command allows you to identify commands that you want to execute if a certain signal is received by this shell script. You have three options. When a process receives a signal, by default it will terminate, which is probably what you're used to happening. Second, you can tell a script to ignore that signal and to simply keep executing. Third, you can list commands to execute if that signal is received. Let's use the interrupt signal in our examples. Signals are numbered to identify which is which. This graphic shows you a list of some of the more useful signals to shell programmers. We're going to concentrate on signal number two, the interrupt signal, which is what is sent to the process when the user types control C or delete or again, whatever your terminal is set to for the interrupt character. When a script receives a signal, it terminates unless you set it to do something different. Let me give you an example. PH menu does not have any way to handle signals. When I run PH menu and press control C, notice that the menu terminates. That's what scripts do when they receive an interrupt. Using the trap command, I can do one of two things. I can either ignore the interrupt and keep the menu going, or I could simply print the message enter Q to quit on the assumption that the reason people are entering the interrupt key is because they want to quit out of the menu. In either case, I want to keep going because I don't want the user thrown into the shell unnecessarily. To ignore the interrupt, I tell the trap command to do nothing if this interrupt occurs. This graphic shows the trap command that will ignore interrupt number two. The trap command is given a set of empty single quotes which tell it to do nothing if the interrupt number two occurs. If I wish to ignore additional interrupts, I would list their numbers there as well, separated by a space. If I'd like to print a message if an interrupt is received, I could use this trap command. Now, inside the single quotes, I've listed the command echo space enter Q to quit. Now, if an interrupt number two comes in, this message will be printed and the script will continue where the interrupt occurred. I've modified the PH menu script so that the first thing that occurs is this trap command. Trap commands are only effective if they've been executed before the signal occurs. I've stored the modified version of PHMenu in a file called phmenu.trap. And let me show you how it works now. When I run phmenu.trap, the menu gets printed. If I now enter a control C, you see the message enter Q to quit. It would continue doing this no matter how many times I entered the interrupt characters. That's because the trap remains set until it is unset. If I would like to unset this trap command, I can set it back to the default processing, which is to terminate, by saying trap and leaving the argument off and then putting a number two after it. I won't demonstrate this, but it is discussed in the course text. The last thing I want to mention has to do with something called shell functions. Because of the way the process environment works, there are certain things that have to be done in the current process and cannot be done in another process. Once another process has been created, it can no longer change the original process because it has a unique process and a unique environment. An example would be the current directory. I must change the current directory within the current process. If I were to generate a new process and run the cd command in the new process, 
I would change the directory of that process, but the original process remains where it was. These are called built-in shell commands. And there are several that have to be built into the shell. The cd command is one. Setting a value to a variable is another, because that has to occur in the local environment of this process. Others are discussed in the course text. One way to get around this, as well as a way to alter the environment that you're working in, is to use what's called a born shell function. A born shell function lets you define a set of characters in a list of commands to be executed if those characters are entered as a command. However, they're all executed within this shell, as opposed to creating a process to execute each command line. Suppose you want to change your prompt so that whenever you change your directory, the prompt itself contains the name of the current directory. This will require you to redefine the cd command so that when it changes your directory, it also updates your ps1 variable. Recall that ps1 is how the current prompt is stored. You can do this with a shell function. A shell function has a very specific format. First you have the name of the function and then a set of parentheses. The delimiting beginning and ending part of the function are an opening and closing set of curly braces. Inside the curly braces sits the body of the function, the commands to be executed if you run this function. Let me create a function called rcd, which stands for raise cd command. I would do that by saying rcd, parentheses, and then an opening brace. First, I want to change to whatever argument I've put on the rcd command line. So I say cd space dollar one. Once I've changed to that directory, I want to redefine the prompt so that it holds the now new current directory. I can do that by running the pwd command and assigning the result to ps1. This requires the use of the back quotes because I want to store the output of pwd into ps1. That line looks like this. ps1 equals double quote, back quote, pwd, back quote, space, dollar sign, space, double quote. Those additional spaces are there so that there's spacing on the other end of my prompt. Now when I change directories, my prompt will always reflect the current directory. Let me show you how it works. I've defined rcd in this shell. I've entered the text of this function directly into the shell, and now when I type rcd, to change back to my home directory, you'll see my prompt changes. If I type cd, the prompt won't change because cd has not been redefined. I've defined rcd as a new cd command. And as long as I use rcd, my prompt will continue to trace my current directory's path name. RCD is but one example of a very useful shell function. Additional shell functions that are also useful are described in the course text. Shell functions are located inside local storage, which means these functions will not be available to you if you move to another process. Also, to load them into the local environment, you have to redefine them every time you log in. In most cases, you'll put function definitions inside your .profile file so that when you log in, they'll automatically be defined for you. There are some additional shell commands that you need to be aware of, and they're discussed in the text in detail. Further, we're not going to cover the applications that are described and developed in the later chapters of the text. For those of you that are interested in more information, I urge you to read those chapters. 
This marks the end of this video course. I hope you've enjoyed watching it. Whatever your opinion, I'd like to hear about it, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm particularly interested in suggestions on how to improve the video course. Please take the time to fill out the evaluation form at the back of the manual and send it to us at this address. If you have any questions about Unix or would like to know more information about our services, pass those requests along to that address as well.